Southern Gothic is a podcast that explores the history behind some of the American South's darkest days, greatest mysteries, and most chilling ghost stories. Take a stroll through the streets of Charleston or Savannah, and you just might notice an intriguing feature of the architecture there, the widespread use of a distinctive color known as haint blue. This sky blue shade that is traditionally used to paint porch ceilings is believed to ward off evil spirits, or as folks from around there call them, haints. Local lore claims that it works for one of two reasons. First, the haints will simply confuse the color for the sky above, and as a result, just pass right on through the porch ceiling. Whereas others say that it's effective because haints are scared of water. So the sight of this particular shade of blue convinces them to stay far away. This now incredibly popular tradition of using haint blue is believed to have originated with the Gullah Geechee people, descendants of West African enslaved men and women brought to the Low Country in the transatlantic slave trade as early as the 17th century. There, on the eastern coastline of North America, they were forced to cultivate rice and indigo. But even amidst the hardship that these people endured, they refused to abandon the religion, languages, and traditions that they brought with them from their own individual African communities. And over time, the variety of these practices evolved into a rich culture. A culture that not only had a language, spirituality, and rituals of its own, but also folklore. Here, in the traditions of the Gullah and Geechee people, that a particularly heinous creature can be found. An evil being said to stalk its victims by day, prowling the low country in search of those who dare not protect themselves with Hank Blue, and then entering their homes at night to feed on their life force as they sleep. This malevolent, vampiric creature is known simply as the Boo Hag. My name is Brandon Schecksnyder, and you are listening to Southern Gothic. For centuries, Folks in the low country stretching from the Carolinas down into Georgia have told stories about a vicious creature known as the Boo Hag. Depending on who you ask, the tales vary. However, most seem to revolve around a man who marries a woman that isn't quite who she seems. For some reason or another, this gentleman has made it to adulthood either without much interest in matrimony, or he just never seemed to find the right girl to settle down with. But then one day, a beautiful stranger came to town and took his breath away. This exquisite woman was like no one he had ever met. She had intoxicating eyes, a smile without equal, and a magnetic charm that left him smitten in no time at all. Before long, this man who once had no interest in marriage was on his knee asking for her to be his wife. And of course, she agreed. Although she had one request, she didn't want to go to a preacher. Rather, she wanted him to take her into the city and be married by a judge, a request that he had no reason to turn down. So they did just that. And soon enough, the couple began their life together. To 
to the man's surprise, his wife was awful good at taking care of him as well. Each night, she cooked him a large dinner with all the fixings you can imagine. And after cleaning up, he'd retire to his rocking chair while his bride sang him to sleep as she sewed in the chair next to him, eventually waking him to put him to bed. This happened over and over again until one day he woke up in the middle of the night and noticed that she wasn't lying there next to him asleep as he'd expected her to be, but he thought little of it and went back to sleep. The following morning when he got up, he noticed that his wife seemed a little exhausted as if she hadn't slept, but again, he shrugged it off and just went about his day until finally, after waking up several more times in the middle of the night, with his wife nowhere to be found, the man got suspicious. Unfortunately, he didn't have anyone to talk to because all of his friends had fallen ill over the previous few weeks. The entire town seemed to have gotten sick, so he sought out the advice of the old conjure woman on the edge of town. In Gullah culture, a conjure woman or a root doctor is a traditional healer who practices folk magic and herbalism to cure illness, provide spiritual guidance, and protect against evil spirits. They're believed to possess supernatural powers that enable them to communicate with ancestors and spirits and use their knowledge of herbs, charms, and spells to influence the natural world. Deeply rooted in the African-American folk tradition, conjure men and women are respected and valued members of the community, so if anyone was able to help this man, it was her. He told her what was going on in his home, describing how he had met his beautiful wife and how things were starting to get a little strange. Immediately, the old woman interjected and asked how the other men in town were doing, to which he told her, they're all sick. The woman nodded, put her hand on his shoulder and said, son, I hate to tell you this, but you married a boo hag. She continued on to describe the supernatural being that the man had gotten caught up with, a female creature who appears thin and emaciated with long stringy hair and glowing eyes, but wears the skin of a human like a suit to cover her hideous, red, slimy, exposed muscles and pulsing blue veins. By day, the creature masquerades as a woman, but at night, she slips out of this stolen skin and goes out to hunt, entering homes through cracks and crevices, and then rides her victim's chest as he sleeps, draining a man's breath or energy, leaving him empty and lethargic the following day. Obviously, this was not exactly good news for the man who just married the boo hag but the conjure woman swore that there was a way to get rid of it. In the book Spooky North Carolina, author S. E. Schlosser explicitly outlined one woman's instructions. There were two facts, she said, about boo hags that when known could rescue a man from her trap. The first fact was that a boo hag couldn't fly through a window or door that was painted blue. The second fact was that if a boo hag didn't get back into her skin before dawn, she would be trapped without it and never again able to disguise herself as human. So if he got himself some blue paint and spread it on every window frame and every door frame, then the boo hag could not enter his house and come dawn would be revealed for the monstrous creature she was. However, if he wanted to be rid of the creature entirely, then he should leave one tiny window frame unpainted and keep it open a sliver so that the boo hag could squeeze through. Then he was to fill up her skin with salt and pepper, which would burn her up from the inside out. By the time she found the unpainted window, the boo hag would be forced to hurry to her skin or forfeit her human disguise. She wouldn't have time to notice the trap had set for her until it was too late.
That night, he did just that. After dinner, the man sat in his rocking chair as he always did. But this time, instead of nodding off, he merely pretended to. So when his wife reached over to him and quietly whispered in his ear, asking if he was awake, he ignored her and continued to act as if he would any other night, although secretly he was wide awake and filled with anxiety over what might happen next. Believing that she was now free to act as she normally would, the woman stood up from her chair and began to go about her business. Carolina storyteller Donna Washington described what one of these unfortunate men saw when he dared peek at the boo hag while she prepared for that evening's hunt. She had taken the spinning wheel out of the corner and stool, and she was sitting on the stool, and she reached her finger up to the light, and then she reached underneath her fingernail, and she started picking and picking until she got out a strand of her skin, and she stuck it into the spinning wheel and started spinning the wheel, and her skin started unraveling off of her fingers, up her arms, down across her elbow, and as her skin came off, she was singing. Spin, 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 oh skin. Spin, 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 oh skin. You can only imagine how disturbing this was for that man to watch as the woman he had fallen in love with transformed into a horrific monster. But he continued to watch anyway, biding his time as the boo hag rolled up its skin, hid it in the attic, and then made its way out of the window into the dark of night. He then immediately sprang into action, running down to the basement and grabbing the cans of haint blue paint that he had stashed away. Feverishly, he painted around the doors and windows of his home and made sure every possible place the boo hag could enter from was addressed, except for one small window above the basement. He then went upstairs to the attic, unrolled the skin, and began to spread as much salt and pepper as he could on the inside before rolling it back up and returning it to where the hag had left it. Now, all he could do was sit and wait. Finally, as dawn grew near, he heard an awful crash in the nearby window. The boo hag had returned and was attempting to get in, but could not cross the blue paint just as the conjure woman had advised. So the hag went from window to window to window, searching for an entrance, away inside before the sun came up, until eventually it found the sole entrance into the basement. The man then watched as the boo hag came dashing up the stairs, hastily trying to get to its skin. And when it finally did, he knew, because he could hear its screams echoing through the house. The conjure woman was right. The salt and pepper caused the skin to burn and smoke, leaving the hag in so much pain, it crashed out of the window, tearing at the skin, trying to pull it off its body as it flew toward the swamp. But without its skin, the boo hag could not survive in the sun. And just as one would expect of a vampire, it burst into flames with one final scream. This is the cautionary tale that the Gullah and Geechee people have passed down for centuries, reminding generation after generation to be vigilant and protect themselves from malevolent forces, whether supernatural or human. To this day, Gullah people may place a broom or a bundle of thorns outside their door, which they believe is another deterrent of the boo hag, who it is said must stop and count the strands or thorns before it can enter the house, a task that'll hopefully keep her occupied till dawn. 
but it's the use of haint blue to protect homes that has truly stood the test of time. Yet this color, which the Gullah people believe had the power to protect them, was also the source of their collective suffering, as it was indigo that was required to produce this hue, one of the main crops that they had been forcibly taken from their homes in West Africa to grow and harvest in America. We'll dig deeper into the history of the Gullah Geechee culture, how the lore of the Buhags sprung from it, and more after the break. During the late 17th century, American colonists discovered that the moist, semi-tropical climate of Georgia and South Carolina was ideal for growing rice. But as these men had no experience harvesting it, they turned to the transatlantic slave trade to solve their problem, purchasing enslaved men and women from Western Africa who were already familiar with how to grow and harvest the crop specifically those from a region known as the Rice Coast that includes present-day Sierra Leone and Liberia. This particular skill set was so highly valued by white plantation owners that they paid higher prices for the enslaved men and women from the region. And as a result, they quickly became the largest enslaved population on low country plantations a number that grew exponentially during the 18th century with the introduction of indigo, a result of the British textile industry's desire for blue dye. But while this was the perfect place to harvest these crops, many white plantation owners found it to be a less than ideal place to live. Aside from the brutal heat and humidity during summer months, the subtropical climate brought with it yellow fever and malaria, which were transmitted by mosquitoes. So fearing an outbreak of illness in their family, most of these men would leave in the spring to find safety in city life during the summer. Meanwhile, the enslaved population continued to work, left under the charge of overseers or rice drivers. The resulting isolation combined with the addition of new enslaved people to the area over time, was critical in helping shape a culture that preserved much of these men's traditional African linguistic and cultural heritage without influence from men of European ancestry. This language soon became known as Gullah English or Sea Island Creole an amalgamation of Central and West African languages with English. Of course, the language wasn't the only product of these circumstances. The spirituality that evolved within the Gullah community was also truly unique, a blend of West African religions with both Islamic faith traditions and Christian rituals. Among these beliefs was that a person has both a spirit and a soul, and when a person passes, it's said that their soul leaves their body, and if it's a good soul, it'll ascend to heaven, while the spirit stays and watches over their family, guiding and protecting them. But a bad spirit becomes a boohag. As we've described, this supernatural being is skinless, slimy, and red in color, much like raw meat with exposed tendons and muscles, as well as matted clumps of hair permeating from its body and horrifying glowing eyes. But most who encounter the creature never actually see it in its natural state, as it'll use the skin of one of its victims to camouflage itself from the world. The creature enters the home of its prey through small cracks or crevices of doors and windows, then crawls up onto their chest, paralyzing them as they suck their breath, 
feeding on their energy. Surprisingly, the Buhag's victims are often left unaware of what happened, the only evidence being the severe fatigue that plagues them when they wake up. Now, while the Buhag is unique to the Gullah Geechee culture, the archetype of the hag has appeared in folklore all over the world for thousands of years. Typically, hags are described as hideous old women who are often depicted as a witch, a sorceress, or crone. These individuals, or possibly even creatures, are frequently associated with evil, darkness, and death, and as a result, are feared and reviled. There are many different types of hags in folklore, but they all share some common characteristics. They are most often old, ugly, and have long, scraggly hair. They are skilled in magic or have some type of supernatural powers that they use to harm others. Some are even shapeshifters. Today, one of the most infamous hags in the world is Baba Yaga, a supernatural being from Slavic folklore. The old, ugly woman is described as having a long hooked nose, a sharp tongue, and a crackling laugh. And she lives in a hut that stands on chicken legs in the middle of the forest. Baba Yaga is a powerful witch who can use her magic to help or harm others. And as a result, she's often seen as a trickster figure, her motives often unclear as she can be both benevolent and wicked, a reminder that the world is not always black and white. Although for the most part, Baba Yaga has been portrayed as evil. Folks primarily know her as a witch who likes to snatch up children to put in her stew. In this role, much like the German hag of Hansel and Gretel, she tends to be used as a cautionary tale of what happens if children misbehave. Hags of this nature can be found in cultures all over the world, but the ones found in African traditions have a particularly menacing attribute. They are vampiric in nature, entering homes at night to feed on the sleeping. This is the folklore that the Boo Hag has evolved from, a nightmarish creature now commonly associated with the medical phenomenon of sleep paralysis. This horrible condition occurs when a person wakes up from sleep, but their brain is still in the dreamlike state of REM, causing them to be unable to move or speak despite being fully conscious. Sleep paralysis can be a terrifying experience as the person may feel a sense of pressure on their chest or the presence of someone or something in the room with them. Today, we understand that sleep paralysis can be caused by a variety of factors, including sleep deprivation, irregular sleep patterns, trauma, anxiety, and sleep disorders. But in the past, this terrifying experience wasn't yet explainable through medicine. So the archetype of the night hag was born, a tradition that has clearly found its way to the Sea Islands with the Goa and Geechee people. Over the years, the Gullah community has struggled to maintain its traditional identity and language in the face of modern society and the encroachment of outsiders. Since the 1960s, the Sea Islands saw increased resort developments, which grew property values by leaps and bounds and threatened to push out the local Gullah population from lands that they had owned for over a century. Activists fought back and in 2006, Congress passed the Gullah Geechee Cultural Heritage Corridor Act, which provided $10 million over 10 years for the preservation and interpretation of historic sites related to their culture, helping protect their legacy for future generations. If you 
ever make it out to the low country, be sure to stay in a place marked with Hank Blue. Because to this very day, folks out there might still warn you, don't let the hag ride you. An expression meant to wish you a good night's sleep. A rest free from the torment of the infamous boo hag. My name is Brandon Sheck Snyder, and you are listening to Southern Gothic. Southern Gothic is an independent podcast produced by siblings Brianne and Brandon Schecksneider. If you're a fan of the show and would like more content, be sure to join us over on Patreon or become a premium subscriber on the Apple Podcast app. There, you'll receive access to both ad-free and monthly bonus episodes. This show is also a member of Airwave Media, a podcast network that features some of the leading storytellers in audio entertainment including other chart-topping podcasts like Redacted History and Historical Blindness. For more info on Southern Gothic, be sure to visit southerngothicmedia.com today. And as always, thanks for listening. Lucky Lady Shacks.